Warning, this episode contains spoilers and strong language. They said we're gonna put a play together Though we don't know yet what it's about We'll let everybody be in it So that there's no one left to be in the crowd No, you think I'm wasting time here Not sculpting up an image to play This is my last letter Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of Schumacast, a podcast where we look at the works of Joel Schumacher. I am your co-host, Angel Tusa. And I am Noel Thingvall. Today we are covering Sparkle from 1976, which Joel Schumacher wrote the screenplay for. Sparkle is the story of a black girl group in the late 50s and early 60s, inspired by the story of Diana Ross and the Supremes. Noel, did you have any experience with this movie before now? No, no. It's one I'd heard of, but I Mm -hmm. had not seen it. I think I had heard of the remake and didn't realize it was a remake. Oddly, I know I've heard of the original even before the remake came out, but I don't know the Mm -hmm. context for why. (laughs) (laughs) I just know that I did. Yeah. Maybe I actually been when Dreamgirls came out, I might have heard of the original. Mm, That would make sense. Just to get into some production notes on the movie. In the last episode, we mentioned producer Howard Rosenman, who worked with Joel on The Killer Bees and Virginia Hill. And it's kind of interesting how all three of these films all seem to happen right around the same time with the same group. And I don't know which order they were all made in, though. So that's kind of interesting. Mm. Sparkle is a project that goes back to the time that he and Joel Schumacher were in New York when both were still dreaming of heading to Hollywood. So they were actually friends before L.A. Okay. They met in 1971 while Joel was still a designer and bonded over a Supreme song that was playing in the back background, their shared love of the history of Motown, and how they both would love to see a film based on that world someday. Hmm. Soon after, Joel did a window display where three mannequins were in identical red sequin dresses, and Rosenman had the idea for Sparkle. (laughs) He wrote a treatment, and a chance encounter led to him optioning it to the production company of Roger Stigwood, which is the same company that made Virginia Hill. Not long after, Rosenman finally made it out to L.A. where he was producing TV movies for ABC, while at the same time, Schumacher had already started doing his films as a costume designer. The first attempt to write Sparkle had been done by Lonnie Elder, the famed playwright who, in 1972, became the first black writer nominated for an Academy Award with the film Sounder. Okay. Now, is that a film you're familiar with? Because I know it's set down in Louisiana. It does sound familiar. I don't know if I've seen it, but I've heard of it. They didn't like his draft, though, and threw most of it out. Hmm. But because this was around the same time that Joel was being nudged by Woody Allen to start writing, Joel decided to take this on as his first screenplay, and he turned in a 200-page epic that he also wanted to direct. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yep. However, while the project did sell the Warner Brothers, there were some caveats. Mm. They had to cut the script by 90 pages, (laughs) and they had to hire Sam Osteen as the director. Sam Osteen, you probably never heard of as a director, but he was nominated three times for an Oscar for editing on films okay. like Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Cool Hand Luke, Rosemary's Baby, and Chinatown. Hmm, okay. And he always wanted to direct, but aside from Sparkle, he only ended up doing a few low-budget romances and TV movies like Queen of the Stardust Ballroom, High Risk, and Rosemary's Baby 2, Look What's <laughs> Happened to Rosemary's Baby, which was a real <laughs> film in the 1970s. What a title. I think that's the real problem. I added the Rosemary's Baby 2 for clarification, but it is titled, Look What's Happened to Rosemary's Baby. Okay. (laughs) And as for Joel Schumacher, while he was disappointed that he didn't get the director's chair, he still stuck with the project and the heavy rewrite and paring down of the script he did himself. So the finished shooting script is still written by Joel. Mm -hmm. So I guess I will go ahead and dive into the synopsis. Take it away. (laughs) Sparkle is a 15-year-old girl living in the late 50s Harlem with her mother and two sisters, Sister and Dee. She sings in the choir and idolizes Sister while doing the best to avoid the advances of Styx, an older boy in the neighborhood who works in a record store and dreams of being a musician. Sister isn't as innocent as Sparkle, dating Styx's cousin Levi because he uses his money to buy her nice things. After attending a show at the local theater, the five teens decide to form their own group and enter a local amateur competition where they win first prize. Levi dreams of making much better money than their small-time winnings and takes a job working for Satin Struthers, a local mob boss. 
His new job leaves him no time to be in the group, but he helps Styx with a connection to get them to play at a local big-time club, on the condition that it will just be the three sisters performing. Sister quickly gets the attention of Satin, who buys her even nicer things than Levi could, but is also abusive and quickly gets her hooked on drugs. Their mother recognizes Satin for the dangerous man he is and tries to warn Sister away from him, but she'd rather put up with the abuse in order to ride in his fancy cars and live in a nice house. Levi begs Satin for bigger jobs, probably with the hope of catching Sister's attention once again. While Sparkle is the dutiful sister who covers Sister's bruises with makeup, Dee has had enough and plans a scheme to find out about Satin's big score and try to get him caught by the police. Unfortunately, Satin secretly sends Levi to cover the job instead, and he is shot and arrested by the police. Satin assumes that Styx is the one who ratted him out, and after the two fight, Styx decides it's better to go upstate and work construction by making some legitimate cash. Dee has also had enough of her sister's lifestyle and wants something more for herself than being a maid for the rich white man, which is all their mother was able to achieve. With the group in tatters, Sparkle decides to stay behind and support their mother and sister as best she can, rather than join Styx. Sadly, her efforts are in vain as Sister passes away, presumably from an overdose. Styx returns for her funeral and tells Sparkle that he thinks her singing voice is something special and she shouldn't just throw it away. With Sister gone, Sparkle doesn't feel like moving forward, but her mother insists that Styx is a good man and she should listen to him and give singing a chance. Without any funds of their own, Styx goes to Mr. Gerber, Mama's boss, and asks him for $10,000 to help make the record. The record is a big hit and Styx is ready to pay Gerber and his financiers back for the full amount, but Gerber insists he keep the cash and just give him and his men the royalties for future sales. Styx refuses. He's abducted by one of Gerber's men as Sparkle and her backing band are playing Carnegie Hall. They repeatedly click an empty gun at him while Sparkle sings, but eventually they let him go. Sparkle and Six are seemingly free to live happily ever after as the movie fades to black. And you can tell me if I'm wrong about that ending, but... <laughs> That's as best as I could understand it anyway. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about that, yeah. Yes. So, Noel, do you recommend this movie? I do. You do? I, do. I think it's a little clunky at times. I think the script can be a bit by the numbers, and you can kind of see where everything's going. Mm -hmm. But I think the direction is good. I think it's well shot. I think the cast is good. The songs are good. I think Joel's script is good. It's not a great movie, but I think it's a good one, and I do recommend it. Okay. Okay. I recommend the soundtrack. <laughs> I saw actually a bit of similarities to Virginia Hill and that I felt like it was a movie that was like touching on story beats, but wasn't necessarily making me feel them mm. in a lot of ways. It's not awful. It's just there's nothing particularly special beyond the music performances that would really make me want to recommend it to people to give it a chance. I think it's definitely a film that it's not one that's just like a blanket. Everyone mm -hmm. go see this movie. Right, sure. But I didn't dislike it. I didn't love it, but it was a good movie. It's one I'm kind of glad I own that I'll probably check out again in a few years. If you like certain types of movies, I would recommend it to him. And, and yeah. <laughs> I think it's definitely a step up from Virginia. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it is. It is. Like I said, it was just, there was a lot of cliches. Yeah. So it was just, oh, of course, now she's on drugs. Oh, you know, like that kind of thing that I just wasn't as emotionally attached to these characters as I would have liked to have been. There were a lot of cliches. Again, the script is by the numbers, but it's like I found a lot of little moments and nuance to it that kind of made those cliches at least feel more real. Mm -hmm. It had a nice grounding. It never felt over the top or corny or anything like that. It just it felt mm -hmm. very grounded. Okay. I just like the way it executed a lot of those things. Yeah, yeah. I guess beyond the ending, which was frustrating. <laughs> yes. I think that was one of two or three moments where they would juxtaposition a song performance with the story moving forward. And I didn't really feel like I said, the ending is really confusing, but there just wasn't a lot of clarity because like you see this whole thing with the mom packing stuff up and it's like, OK, is she about to kick sister out? Like what is going on? And then eventually they do cut afterward and you see them actually talk and it's like, OK, no, she's just trying to give her advice. Sister is the one choosing to leave. It's just shot in a confusing sequence with the editing there mm. that I was like, what is going on here? Just enough to like take me out of the movie a little bit. And like I said, it's not awful. It's not like, oh, God, stay away from this as far as you can. It's just 
I don't find enough here to give it a full recommend. Right. Well, and you know, moments like that were interesting to me because I did read the screenplay. The screenplay that I read was largely the shooting script. It was pretty much this. It had some bits mm-hmm. that were cut out that I'll get to later. But like scenes that you mentioned, like the montages playing over the song sequences, mm-hmm. what was interesting about those is that in the script, those were fully scripted scenes Okay. that I want to believe were shot and then were just edited into montages. Right, right. Like there's also the scene where we see Sister as the wasted bar singer, mm-hmm. where we're also cutting with Sparkle giving her drug money and all that stuff. Yes. Like that was a scene that fully played out and like the one you mentioned where sister is leaving home Mm -hmm. i'm wondering if maybe it just worked better for me because i already had the context of what was happening you may have yeah it might be but i also just thought the montage was a nice effective way to cross time yeah like i said if it had just been a little clearer like i don't think it's an awful idea to do it that way i just in some ways i was like wait okay what exactly happened and then there's other scene where she's visiting levi to tell his sister's dad there's a couple other scenes with levi Like all those have been done in the montage. I don't really Mm -hmm. think anything was lost, though. It was mostly just dialogue and you kind of know how the scenes are going to play out. Right. I only included the part where like Levi gets arrested in my Mm -hmm. synopsis because I was feeling like, yeah, we see him again, but he's not really contributing anything to this story in any way. It's just like, okay, yeah, he's still in prison. He's still got a thing for sister that, you know. (laughs) And that's where I think the story is just, they start out as a group and then they go their separate ways. Mm -hmm. In the end, Sparkle is the only one who lasts. Right. Ultimately. That's where I almost think I would have actually liked to see in some scenes with Dolores, mm-hmm. kind of carrying on her thread a bit more. Levi in the yeah. script did pop up again at the end after he gets let out of jail, but they cut that. Okay. Again, not really contributing anything, but it's just completing his art. Yeah. He was part of this group at the beginning, and this is where his life took him off to the side. You know, I kind of mm-hmm. didn't mind that structurally. But going back to something you mentioned, though, comparing this to Virginia Hill, it does mm-hmm. breeze over a lot very briskly. Right. Like, I mean, this is a pretty long span of time. There's a lot of characters. Yeah. I didn't mind it as much here, though. And even though there's stuff from the script that was deleted, it's not really anything that other than the ending. There's not Mm -hmm. much that's significantly lost that you're still not getting. Like, I think the biggest thing was Satin actually finding out Mm -hmm. what happened to him, where after Levi got arrested and that drug bust went down, his bosses broke both of Satin's legs. Hmm, okay. And he just started getting even worse and worse to sister, and she was pouring all of her money into his medical bills, and the two of them were just addicts together. Mm -hmm. I imagine that the 200-page original script must have had a lot, and maybe that's why it feels brisk in some ways, is that he had this much longer draft, and he went to condense it, and, you know, some things ended up going by a lot faster, where maybe in the original he let them breathe a little more. Right, and I didn't mind it so much, because even on the page in the draft that I read, I kind of liked the flow that it had. Mm -hmm. The film, I think, maybe tightens it up just a hair too much, like, Maybe give it like an extra five, ten minutes here and there. Yeah. But it didn't feel like I was losing anything by not having read the 200 page draft. (laughs) Right, sure. I mean, I will say I actually really enjoyed reading the script. It was actually a pretty good script. Yeah, I just kind of feel like you almost could take Levi out completely. I feel like that might have been a better way to almost condense it. Like maybe just sat and sees their show and so he develops a thing for Sister and that's how she gets involved with that. Like you didn't necessarily need him as a branch and then he just drops off. Well, I think he was a nice mirror to hold against Styx, you know, where yeah. Styx stays on the up and up and does everything right, whereas Levi doesn't care about anything but showing off and success and he goes down the wrong path. But you've already got that with the sisters? Mm. I get that you're comparing the two men that way, but sister, like, she wants her fancy things and her riches and she's willing to put up with a lot to get it. Sparkles being on the straight and narrow, but not really taking chances. And then you've got Dolores, who's like, I'm better than this and I'm going to go find something better. So I feel like the three of them cover that really well, that you don't necessarily need that other angle. I don't know. I kind of like that because it also showed a different consequence to this. I mean, like Mm -hmm. sister shows the consequence, drugs and, you know, addiction, all that stuff. And he is, you go to jail. But Mm -hmm. I actually kind of like that that's not the end. He's actually still living. Mm -hmm. I kind of like that he's still that tie to their past. I like that there was a presence to him. I wish that there had been a bit more. Again, like just have a capper at the end of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Like when he comes out and have him be seeing her concert. Mm -hmm. I like that we didn't forget him. That's fair. I just was kind of like, is this going anywhere? That was my personal feeling. It was like, okay, 
Yeah, he's still there. He's still in prison. <laughs> and again, I like that most of it was just kind of relegated to montages. And it's again showing the passage of time where everyone's mm-hmm. lives are changing and he's still sitting in the same cell, you know. And again, it's showing consequence for his choices. Mm-hmm. Let's go ahead and talk about the three sisters. I didn't even know Dolores' name until <laughs> halfway through the movie. <laughs> I do think she ended up being the more underdeveloped character. She did, which is a shame because it seems like there was the potential to make her something really interesting there. Like her one scene with Mama was pretty strong, yeah. but it just came out of nowhere after her being in the background for most of it. It did. And I remember the script had like these little moments of her reading books about the Black Pride movement and mm. starting to attend meetings and you see her going off with a different set of friends and it would have been interesting to have still a bit of that build there. And then Mm -hmm. the other thing is, yeah, that's a great payoff where she's like, this just isn't the life that I want and I'm not happy here. Right. Again, I would like to have had a payoff where again, have her come back during the final concert or during sister's funeral or just see where is she now? Where is life taken her? Right. It would have been interesting to explore. I agree. But I like the arc of sister. Yeah. Once again, it's a little cliche, but no, I thought Lynette McKee did a really good job as sister, even Mm -hmm. if it was a cliche performance. Great singing voice, too. And I saw she is still like a playwright and a Broadway actress and does a lot of one-woman shows. She teaches and she's had a really good career. Again, I like the nuance of it. I kind of like that because of her beauty, she's the more snobby and privileged of the group Mm -hmm. who thinks that she's the center spotlight. And it almost does seem like it is her movie in the beginning there, I I felt like. The character of Sparkle is totally in a supporting role to Sister. Like I was sitting there going, why is this movie called Sparkle if it's about Sister? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and that's what's interesting is like this is kind of based on Diana Ross and the Supremes. Mm -hmm. Sister is basically who Diana Ross was. Diana Ross was not the one who rose out of the background she was the front and center from the beginning yeah right that's what i kind of like is they're not just doing a straight adaptation it's like they're taking mm-hmm. elements and then kind of twisting them right and then that she goes the direction she does the abusive relationship with satin the drugs yeah and i actually genuinely found that to be a powerful scene her final scene where she's singing in the bar yeah yeah I mean, like I said, her singing voice, I mean, she definitely sells every emotion with that, yeah. And then what did you think of Irene Cara as Sparkle? She's a little more, I guess, understated, but I guess you can tell she's fairly new to acting at that point. And she was only 17 at the time, too. Right. She seems very genuine and real, which I think is perfect for the character. Mm Mm-hmm. And Irene Cara, she's been more a professional singer over the years. She also Mm. stars in Fame. Right. But mostly she's known for, she did not only the main theme song for Fame, but she did Got a Feeling, the song for Flashdance. Oh, yeah, yeah. So she's more famous as a singer even to this day. Right, sure. Makes sense. But again, I like that there's a genuineness to her and a sincerity to her. Mm Mm-hmm. And again, how she just kind of rises out of the background instead of like it being her from the start. Right. As she comes out of the sister's shadow. There's something kind of endearing about somebody who doesn't necessarily want that spotlight. Mm -hmm. It makes you like her a lot, the way she blossoms eventually. Yeah. She's so down to earth. Mm Mm-hmm. Anything else you want to say about like the dynamics of the sisters? I guess like Sparkle's main goal was she felt like she had to take care of sister, Mm -hmm. but you think she would have been a little bit more on Dee's side in terms of, yeah, you really shouldn't be in this relationship and we should be trying to get you out of this instead of just letting you stay where you are. Yeah, especially when she's actively getting sister drugs and stuff. Yeah, that's not helping. Yeah. What do you think of Mary Alice as Effie, their mother? She was great. I think she played at, at the right level, I guess, is the best way to, you know, like she was this woman that she knew her station in life and she had made peace with it, I think, is mm-hmm. the best way to say it. But she also clearly wanted a lot more for her daughters and she really cared about them. Yeah, I don't think she had any shame in being someone who worked. Right. And did right. this work in order to raise and support her daughters. She sees these opportunities and I love that you get to see that she sees the genuine talent that they have. Right. But in the same moment that she also sees Satin, you know, so she sees both the dangers and the positivity coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, like near the end of the movie where Sparkle doesn't want to go in and perform solo where she's the one who says, what's the harm in just giving it a shot? Right, right. And did you recognize the actress? No. She's the one who took over as the Oracle in the second and third Matrix movies after the first one passed away. Uh Okay, okay. I remember it was like halfway through the movie and I'm like, she looks so familiar. I I haven't seen those nearly as much. (laughs) I haven't watched them that often either. 
And then what's interesting is the age range, because this crosses a span of time and it starts when all the girls are teenagers. Mm -hmm. The actress who plays Sparkle was 17. Right. The actress who plays Sister was in her early 20s. Okay. Yeah. The actress who plays Dolores was 31. <laughs> okay. And the actress who played their mother was 34. <laughs> Gotta love how that works out sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it, but you know what? I thought it didn't really stand out at all. And again, mm -hmm. because there's such a passage of time. Right, right. One bit that they cut from the script was, I can't remember if it was like around the middle of the movie or in the later part when Sparkle's trying to decide, the mother actually reveals that she sang in the past too. Oh, okay. Not that she did it professionally, but that she cut a yeah. little demo track and we also hear a little story about their father and all that. Mm. And I kind of missed having that there, but I don't. it wasn't entirely necessary. Yeah, I can see why they chose to cut it. I know one of the criticisms when this came out from some of the critics at the time was that the movie is still very exploitational in terms of how it does like sex and crime and drugs. and Right. Yeah, I can see that. Those elements are there, but did you really feel that they were played in an exploitational way? I mean, I would say like the scene with Satin and Sister where he's like telling, you know, thank me for the fur coat or whatever it was. That was a little much. Crawl. Yeah, like, I can see that to some extent. I didn't think there was anything particularly about, like, the use of the drugs or anything that was... You know what I'm like? I guess that's probably the main one that I think would stand out to me in terms right. of that kind of thing. I mean, honestly, beyond, like, the drug use and a few, like, curse words and things like that, like, I would have thought this was a made-for-TV movie. Right. Right. There's not a whole lot of nastiness or anything to make it seem like a hard R or anything like that. Right. And again, like anytime there's sex, it's always off screen. Mm -hmm. The violence that's committed to Sister. I mean, there's that one bit where he starts punching her in the bed. But again, that goes off screen. Right. There is a lot of darkness to this movie, not just in the cinematography. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of darkness to the story. But I always liked, again, how they played it in a very grounded way. It never felt like it was garish or in your face. Yeah, no, it really wasn't. It felt honest mm -hmm. without being gross. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned the darkness. The scene where Mama is telling Sparkle to go ahead and give it a chance, she says her last line and her face is like completely in shadow. Yeah. And I'm like, was that just the best shot they had that <laughs> night and they couldn't go back? Like, surely they didn't mean to do that. That's why I think is I mentioned to you before we were recording that I found this essay written by the producer on the making of the movie. Mm. Even he's like, I think we shot it a little too underlit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the thing is, I kind of like the darkness and the use of shadow in the movie. I think it does cross the line a few times. Mm -hmm. I like the mood that it sets. But I think there's times when the movie could be brighter, and I think there's times when they don't tie the use of shadow to the emotions of the scene as best right, they could. Right, right. I mean, it is primarily set in, like, nightclubs and stuff like yeah. that, so you do expect a degree of dimness anyway. Almost the entire movie is set at night, too. Yeah. There's a couple of the early scenes when they're kids, and then the, whenever they're in the church, but otherwise right. it's almost always set at night in the dark. Mm-hmm. Part of that is I know that it was shot on a studio back lot at Warner Brothers, so I don't know how much yeah, that okay. affected it. But yeah, I looked him up. The cinematographer is the same guy who shot Dirty Harry. <laughs> Okay. And was like Clint Eastwood's cinematographer for like 20 some years and also did like hmm. the with Beverly Hills Cop, which I even remember as a teenager <laughs> watching and I was like, but it's so underlit. <laughs> it's his style, I guess. Yeah. So that was amusing. <laughs> <laughs> and then there were the songs and, and the original soundtrack by Curtis Mayfield, the Motown yes. legend. Yeah. The moment I saw his name, I was like, oh, okay, this is going to be pretty good. And mm -hmm. Nearly all the songs. I mean, I don't think I had any that I thought were bad or anything. It was all pretty good stuff. Yeah. And then that was one of the other funny things from Howard Rosamond is one of the other caveats when they sold this to Warner Brothers is they had this other guy set up to do music and they're like, but you can't use him. You got to use Curtis Mayfield. And they're like, oh, we never thought we could. <laughs> That's a good change. We yeah. won't complain about that, yeah. I mean, yeah, the songs are good. Uh, what's interesting is they never released the soundtrack to this movie. What they did was they released an album where Aretha Franklin covered every song from the movie. <laughs> Why not? 
I had read that they purposely looked for new talent Mm -hmm. for the girls. So you would think that they would have wanted to make an album to promote them and make them into stars. But maybe they ran out of budget for that. I don't know. Could have. And again, I think the songs are good, and I kind of like how it starts with just simple doo-wop hits, and then mm-hmm. gradually the songs become more personal and more about stuff. Mm-hmm. And I honestly think my favorite scene in the entire movie is that scene in the recording studio where Sparkle's having a hard time getting into the song, and Styx comes in and sings with her. Mm-hmm. And it just holds on this close-up of the two singing to each other. Yeah. And a single shot, no cuts to it. And it helps that it's a good song, but I just thought that was a mm-hmm. really, really well-done scene. Mm-hmm. And we didn't mention Sticks. That's Tubbs from Miami Vice. <laughs> Which it took me like pretty much all the way through watching the film. I'm like, I know this guy. He looks so familiar. See, I never watched Miami Vice. <laughs> and then finally I was like, oh my God, it's Tubbs. <laughs> <laughs> And Tubbs can sing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, well, you know, that's like one of those shows, like my dad watched it every week and I can't tell you anything about what happened in that show, but I know I watched it <laughs> with him, you know. But yeah, that was funny. And then Levi, the guy who played him, I don't know his name. Dorian Harewood. Yeah, he's been in a lot of stuff. He's one of those yes. character actors you see in a ton of stuff to this day. Mm-hmm. But no, I, I like the cast in the movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a good cast. Again, the characters aren't the deepest. The script is very breezy, but I don't dislike how any of it's done. Like the dialogue, I don't dislike. Mm-hmm. The way the scenes are constructed, I don't dislike. I mean, for yeah. a first time writer, I think it was a good script. Sure. I'm hoping Car Wash will be an even better script. That one's a little more of a comedy, if I remember correctly. Right. You don't always have to have the strongest characterization for comedy movies. And the thing that also helps Sparkle is, while it's very brisk and breezy, I thought there was a lot to the story. Mm-hmm. Whereas the problem with Virginia Hill was there was just not much story and everything was just cutting like you were almost getting like one out of every five pages in this script. (laughs) This one, it still felt like a complete package. Yeah, I guess it was particularly more toward, I think, the beginning is that I felt like a lot of those early scenes were a way to get us to the next musical performance Mm. and not necessarily really investing too much in emotion and tying you to the characters. I think it got better as it went along, but, you know, it was like, oh, he's got to have a scene with the record store owner where he wins tickets so they can go to the theater and watch them sing. Oh, they got really inspired by that. So now they want to do their own show, you know, like that kind of thing. You know, like the record store thing that also shows that Styx literally grows up in a musical environment. He knows how to hold a job. He's respected by his boss. Yeah. And I also like how that starts is like the very first gig they can get as teenagers is in this just ratty old burlesque club. Where the guy introduces them as the farts. <laughs> yeah, with that MC and they're like hooking off the poor lady who's doing the song in front of them and... They're getting their foot in the door and they still win the trophy and they're full of things. But Levi's already kind of wandering off and Styx is realizing Mm. he works better as a manager and we could present the sisters as a group. So then he gets them into a better venue. And that Mm -hmm. goes from just being a single song to being a regular show. And I like how it's showing that progression. Mm -hmm. And it's also showing Styx's capabilities as a business because he is a very effective manager. Yeah. And then I think that kind of brings us to, you want to bring up the ending? Sure. Was Gerber involved with the mafia or not? Yes. Yes, because we saw that scene with them all having dinner together. Mm -hmm. So they build all this stuff of like, oh, no, you can't do that. This is serious. They can't just let you go. But then they do let him go. So what do you think the story is behind that? I felt it was like, we need to find a happy ending now. So let's have a happy ending. Jack happened to be watching it with me. Oh, yes. Let's hear Jack's theory. He didn't see the dinner table scene. So he was like, oh, I think the mom set the whole thing up. (laughs) And it was a bluff just to make sure that Styx wasn't going to be like the other guy and end up in jail and do bad business deals. After all this time. (laughs) The thing is, because I saw that other scene and I was like, but his related to the mafia. Mm -hmm. So did mama call in a favor for from Gerber and say, please don't kill him this time. Like, why would he just scare him a little bit and then let him go? That's what I'd have a hard time understanding. So you're ready to hear what happened in the script? Yes. Styx was killed. All right, then. <laughs> Those were not Gerber's men. Those were the men that Gerber got. Because Gerber was a middleman. He was right. perfectly happy letting this kid go, but he knew he was in with dangerous people. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's as the song is going on, the mom's waiting at the door and 
you just keep seeing this car going around. And at one point, as the car rounds a corner, they throw out a body and it sticks. Mm -hmm. And the person who shows up is the wife of Gerber, the woman that Effie works for, who just shows up and shakes her head. And that certainly seems like that's what they were leading to. Right. So that makes sense. The entire theme is... These five teenagers that all start together, Mm -hmm. gradually they all one by one fall away and all that's left is sparkle. Right. That makes sense. So did the studio said, no, you can't have that downer of an ending and they made them change it? I mean, what happened? (laughs) Just looking at the movie, I'm betting it was a reshoot Mm. because it's like the scene with Gerber smiling and Mm -hmm. the scene with him showing up and standing by Effie only require those actors so it's a minimum shoot right and i think there was still supposed to be more poignancy to wherever you are out there sticks this is for you was supposed to be playing (laughs) as we're just looking around and sticks is nowhere except he's just a body lying in the middle of the street somewhere yeah and it was supposed to show that even doing it honorably and on the up and up still led to that fate Mm -hmm. i almost think that was a bit too tragic i guess the main thing is is that because you're leading to it and then you don't have any good explanation for why it suddenly doesn't lead to it I agree that it would be a real downer to end it that way. When they abducted him, I was like, oh, man, this is going to suck for her. She's got this big moment and he's going to die. And, you know, I was thinking that. But like I said, the main thing is that it was like when Gerber's there and the guy approaches him and he just shakes his head and then Gerber smiles. And I'm like, okay, like. It's like he was just testing the kid to see if he was noble. But why would he do that? Right, exactly. (laughs) Like this montage is not telling me enough for me to fully understand what is going on here. And that's why I think it was something that was just very hasty put in because other than that everything else Mm -hmm. is as it was in the script okay yeah and then the script actually then had a further sequence where the end credits played over Styx's funeral but you didn't really need that no I honestly would have just cut that entire subplot I'd just have it be he pays back Gerber everything's Mm -hmm. going good and they finally get to this big concert venue and he's watching and she's singing And if you're going to do a montage, have it be a montage looking back at all these other people. Like, have that be the montage where you do, where's Levi now? Where's Dolores now? Show Sister's grave, you know, show where Satin is now, just kind of in a hospital ward somewhere. Yeah, I agree. That would have been really good. Yeah, instead of making it like this bittersweet, her success on top of this tragedy, just have it be this reflection of who are all these other people who helped get us here. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would have been better. And the thing is, we're going to find, I think, with Joel Schumacher is Joel Schumacher does like bittersweet a lot. (laughs) Just from my knowledge of him, he does not mind taking a dark route. Well, yeah. Certain movies off the top of my head, I can definitely, yeah. (laughs) Oh, yes. I get the point of it. Again, all these people falling aside, sparkle rising. But I think you could have just kept Mm -hmm. it as sparkle and sticks. They finally did it right. And now they're both successful because of it. And now they're moving on with their lives while also reflecting on the people that they've left behind. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm betting that that was a reshoot that was done late. There were limits to what they could probably do. Yeah, that makes sense. I agree that the ending as it is doesn't work. Right. Yeah. Just because of that one weird moment. It was like every click of the gun we have to like watch. But it felt like it was like, come on. Okay, just shoot him or don't, you know? They put so much sweat on him. They had to make yes. <laughs> Oh, someone had to have a spritz bottle off camera. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Spritz them up. We're doing another take. (laughs) He's starting to rust the gun. (laughs) Overall, I still enjoy the movie. Mm -hmm. I even love side characters like the neighbor who's always hanging out with the mom and criticizing everyone. And that's where I kind of love the whole thing of, oh, let's put the mom and the neighbor at this one table. But that's Satin's table. Well, Satin could just sit with mom. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and that was nice because it showed you just how tough the mom could be Mm because she was like, okay, let him come here. I don't care. You know, it didn't bother her any. And then like, I love how they're trying to uh, recapture the act by then bringing in Toon Ann, the other girl from the gospel choir, who's like, I think I'm going to shit my pants. (laughs) (laughs) And I kind of like how she's a character who is throughout the movie. You see her when they're teenagers, you see them later Mm -hmm. on, you see her at the funeral. And she does eventually become one of Sparkle's backup singers. Right. I kind of like how she sticks through. It does have some nice little bits of humor in it. Mm -hmm. There's some nice little moments sparkled in. Sparkled in there. Listen to me. (laughs) 
Sprinkled in, sparkled in. Sprinkled in, in, yes, that's what I meant. And I will say, for a first screenplay by a guy who got into the industry costume designing and had never written a (laughs) screenplay before, again, I think this is a script that would make me read another script by this writer. Mm. I don't think it's a bad script. I think he knows how to structure the story well. The characters are good. His scene construction is, I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not saying any of this is great. Right, right. Other than that scene in the recording studio, which I genuinely think is a great scene. There's nothing Mm. here that I'm saying is a great movie, but it's a good one. It's a movie that when I start it, I want to finish it. (laughs) It's not a film I would recommend against anyone. (laughs) (laughs) I guess to me, what holds me back or whatever from it, like, I feel like it could have probably gone through maybe one more rewrite just to touch up some of these characters, definitely fix that ending if that was how they wanted to do it. You know, that kind of thing. It's not awful. It's just not quite strong enough for a full recommend. No, and that's where I'd genuinely be curious to read that 200-page script. Mm -hmm. And I will say, just even reading it, Joel has a nice, breezy writing style. It was a very easy script to read. It all flowed along pretty smoothly. He Mm -hmm. never got buried in the writing. You know, (laughs) some people can just overwrite to the point where it's like, and get on with it. All the scenes were very concise. They were focused. His dialogue was snappy. Again, he had some good funny lines in there. Mm -hmm. I liked how it played out on page. And it makes me glad that I I have some other Joel Schumacher scripts that I can read. (laughs) And I would also be curious to read that very early draft by the guy who wrote Sounder. Mm. Because, I mean, one of the other things is this is a very black movie. It's a movie about black culture, black music and all that stuff. That's right. still being made by white people. Yeah, yeah. It is a little bit of a head scratcher on that, but I guess for the time period. But again, you know, Howard Rosenman and Joel Schumacher are from that part of New York. They literally went to these type of clubs mm-hmm. and these type of theaters. They went to Harlem all the time. Right. So, I mean, it's still an environment that they grew up in and lived in, even though they're not fully a part of it. <laughs> Right. But it's interesting that they did actually have a black writer, the first black Academy Award nominated screenwriter. And they're like, no, nah, let's toss it out. Joel, <laughs> give us a draft. Yeah. I would just be curious to read it in comparison. Mm-hmm. Anything else you want to bring up on the movie? No, I think that's it. For the release of the film, this is going to be a little awkward because <laughs> box office mojo doesn't go back at this point. So I don't have all the box office data. I don't have the full week by week. I've kind of constructed one thanks to IMDb. And the thing is, while Wikipedia does say the budget was $1 million and it made a profit of $4 million, the box office totals for this movie were actually never publicly released, so we don't know what they were. Mm. It's a film that was declared to be a bomb, and it's a film that I know from what I've done a little bit of research on, it was very popular in black neighborhoods, Mm -hmm. but elsewhere it never really got a very wide release. It didn't screen in like a wide majority of theaters. Yeah. Doing $4 million against a $1 million budget when you have a limited release in certain areas, that's still not bad. Mm -hmm. And it did go on to become a cult hit. So this came out on April 7th of 1976, which was a Wednesday. And looking this up, I was surprised back in the 70s. Films were released on Wednesdays and Fridays and Sundays. (laughs) Oh, okay. There were no hard and fast rule on that. Okay. Right. In March leading up to this, we had Robin and Marion and the David Bowie movie, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Those were the two big ones. Okay. The same week that this came out, and this is probably why this did not get a wide release and was declared unsuccessful. You had two other movies that were probably competing for the head of the box office at the time. You had All the President's Men, Mm -hmm. the big Nixon-Watergate scandal Mm -hmm. movie about Woodward and Bernstein, which, of course, went on to become not only one of the most successful films of the year, but was like one of the major Oscar movies of the year. Right. And was incredibly topical at the time, so everyone was Mm -hmm. probably curious to see it. And you had The Bad News Bears. (laughs) Which, you know, like one of the major cult movies (laughs) of the 70s. So it's like those two coming out at the same time as Sparkle. Sparkle had no chance. No, no. I'm even trying to look around like, well, what came out after? Well, it doesn't really matter because it was all the presidents <laughs> men and bad news bears. Right, exactly. Yeah. This time in the 70s, you also had a lot of porn oh, that was yeah. still getting wide releases at the time in theaters. Mm-hmm. This was soon after the death of Bruce Lee. So you had the whole wave of everyone trying to be the next Bruce Lee movie. Mm. My favorite title of them all was Exit the Dragon, Enter the Tiger. and a lot of foreign horror movies and thankfully it won't be too many episodes till we get up to 1982 and i can use box office mojo (laughs) 
<laughs> but I mean, like that was the year that Rocky mm-hmm. was the major film. A Star Is Born, The Omen, yeah, the horrible remake of King Kong, <laughs> and then that was also when Rocky Horror Picture Show, which had bombed earlier, began its midnight movie screening re-release and became a massive success. Uh, okay, yeah. Oh, and that started on April first. Seven days before the release of Sparkle. Yeah. <laughs> so in New York, everyone was going to see <laughs> right, right. Rocky Horror Picture Show. And I forgot to mention Dreamgirls, which I know one of the big similarities between Sparkle and Dreamgirls, because, you know, they're both based on Diana Ross and the Supremes. It's worth right. pointing out the Broadway play of Dreamgirls came out just a few years after Sparkle. I want to say 7980. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, yeah, I don't have much else about the release. Anything else you want to add? I'm looking forward to checking out the remake. The fact that Whitney Houston's involved gets me excited about that. As of right now, Noel and I have not actually watched the remake, but we will be coming back in just a few moments for you. But in a couple weeks for us, we're going to watch the remake and we'll be letting you know our thoughts about that as well. And through the magic of editing, two weeks have passed and we have watched the remake. Noel, would you like to give us some history on how this came about? When the original Sparkle came out, it should be pointed out, Whitney Houston was 13 years old at the time. Mm. And this became one of her favorite films. It not only was one of her inspirations for going into a music career, but it just continually was one of her favorite films. And in the 90s, she moved into films with Bodyguard. The Bodyguard, I think, was the first big one, yeah. Preacher's Wife. She purchased the rights to remake this, I want to say late 90s, early 2000s, not to star in, but she just always wanted to do a remake. Mm -hmm. And initially, it was going to star the singer Alia, which, if you don't remember, died in a plane crash in 2001. Right. Then (laughs) Raven-Symone was at one point being looked at to star in the film. And I don't really know much of the history about that. But anyways, the production kind of languished for a while, Mm -hmm. and it didn't resurface until around 2010, 2011. When they brought in the husband and wife team of Mara Brock Akil and Salim Akil, where he'll direct, she'll produce, they'll both write it together. And the two of them had only really done one other film, which was Jumping the Broom the year before this, and primarily worked in television on shows like Soul Food, Being Mary Jane, The Game, and the upcoming CW Black Lightning. Okay. That's all I got. Though I should probably mention, while Howard Rosenman, who co-wrote the original film and was the producer of the original film, is still an executive Mm -hmm. producer on this, as far as I could tell, Joel Schumacher had no involvement. Right, right. Not even as like an executive producer or anything. Obviously, we're early in analyzing his style, but I didn't necessarily see any influence beyond his original script being used as a starting point. Right. So do you recommend this version of the film? I do. I thought the original was a good film. It was a little clunky. It was a little at times, a little by the numbers. But I think this is a really good film. Still not great, but I think the direction has a lot more style to it. I think the characters are much more fleshed out. I think it's a deeper and richer movie. I like what it does with the music. There's a few bits that I think the original did better, but I think this is one of those remakes where they took the original as a starting point and really went off in a good direction with it. And I agree. Like, you know, I was saying that I kind of felt like the original needed at least one more rewrite. And I think that when they approached this remake, I think somebody was sitting there thinking, okay, what worked, what didn't work with that one? And they really managed to put together something that, at least in my feeling, is definitely superior to the original. I liked it a lot. It still feels like a low budget flick, but that doesn't hurt it in any way. It's just, that's the budget, but it's a really well done film and I enjoyed it quite a lot. I like the performances a lot better in this one. The writing is tightened up quite a bit, obviously. So yeah, definitely recommend. One of the interesting things I'd say about the original film is the original film, you could almost kind of look at as like, this is almost a slightly more documentary-ish. Here's how like events would play out in the real world. This is a little Mm -hmm. more of like a film film. Yeah. It's a little more cinematic. It's a little more dynamic. Mm -hmm. The original film was helped and hurt by that very stark cinematography. Right. This one is more lush and engaging. Yes, yes. I guess right off the bat, we'll go through the characters and Sparkle from the beginning. Jordan Sparks, not only is her voice very good, but I really liked the way that they made it so that she writes all the songs Mm -hmm. in this version. 
it makes much more sense right off the bat that, okay, that's why this movie is about her and not called Sister. It's about her emerging from behind the others. Exactly, exactly. And she's a great actress, and I like how it opens with right from the start. She's the one who's initiating this. She's the one who's getting her sister to sing her songs. Right. Even as the story goes along, you know, she no longer needs other people to sing her stuff. She's mm-hmm. able to strike a deal with the record company without sticks. Right, yes. She is very much driving her own life, even as she's coming to the realization that she needs to be the front runner of it. Yeah, and it's a natural progression. Like, at first, she's kind of shy and afraid mm-hmm. to take the spotlight, but over time, she gains more and more confidence, and it's really good. I like that a lot. I especially love the scene where she's with the record executive and is just <laughs> listing all the types of songs that she has and why she can be an asset to them. Mm-hmm. It's like, I've had this life experience. That's 13 songs. (laughs) I've had this life experience. That's another 27, you know? Right, right. One thing that was interesting was how this film used the songs from the original film. Like, how do you mean? Most of the songs that she's doing throughout the film are the same songs from the original film Uh until you get to the big finale where it's, this is our brand new song. Right, right. I like actually having a song called One Wing. I thought was a really nice touch and a good way to sort of bring the whole thing full circle with yeah. sister and yeah. And that was always a really nice line of dialogue from the original of, you know, I can't fly with just one wing. Right. I didn't love the song as much, but yeah, I just don't think R. Kelly is as good as the guy who did the songs in the original. You know, it's kind of like the whole Woody Allen issue of like, I can't help but hear R. Kelly and go, eh, and not feel too good about listening to anything he does at this point. So Yeah. But even then, I just didn't think it had quite the same hooks to it as some of the older songs. And no. it's like, this is what she's been building towards. It's like, I kind of want to hear those again. <laughs> right, right. It wasn't bad. Again, Jordan Sparks, great singer, mm-hmm. a great talent. Oh, yeah. She brought as much as she could to it. But I agree, the writing is not as strong as the stuff that Curtis Mayfield was doing yeah. for the original. And I think as someone who came into this film, not as an actress, but as a singer, I thought even acting wise, she did a very good job. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. No complaints there. Obviously, like since we were talking about Whitney Houston and how Mm. much she loved this film, she's probably a good person to talk about next. Her role as Emma. I guess we should also mention for people to know, this is the last film that Whitney did before Mm. she passed away. She passed away about three months after this from a lot of complications, but I guess overdose would certainly be within that. And I do kind of feel like, and maybe it's just because I was thinking about it, but I feel like there are some scenes where you can tell maybe she was a little under the influence because there are some scenes that are really, really strong and she does fantastic And then there are others where she just feels like she's going through the motions. She's a little glazed, yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad we got to hear her sing. Yeah. Her performance at the church was amazing. Because in the original, you know, Sparkle sings that song, which is good. But I think if you're going to let Whitney Houston sing in this song, the church is the obvious place to give her that number. And once again, just fantastic. I mean, she's always been a fantastic singer, obviously, but it's a really strong performance. I mean, yeah, that song especially, she doesn't have the same range that she used to, Mm -hmm. but she still has marvelous control over the range that she has. And it is just, it's a powerful song. Again, it's a reminder of that's why Whitney Houston. Right, right. I think less successful was the duet that they played over the end credits. Yeah. But again, that's partially because that was probably more of an R. Kelly song that just, I don't find Mm -hmm. his compositions that interesting. Right. What did you think of the idea of changing her from a working class maid to someone who had a musical history and was burned by it and is now kind of more just the middle class church mom? Especially because the timeline moves ahead at least about a decade, I think, as far as when this starts. So having her, you know, run her department store and I think that makes more sense than necessarily being a maid. I don't think that was essential to her character in any way. So that's a good change, I think, or at least not a bad one. I don't know how else to describe it. Right. And I think it was an interesting change to have her instead be someone who she's been through a very rough period in her life. You know, her music career took her down dark paths. She ended up mm-hmm. getting pregnant at 16. Yeah. And that kind of led her to embrace religion and, and the structure of her nice religion. But that's also led to a kind of righteousness for her. 
and a yeah. commanding follow my ways while you're under my house. Right. Even right. two daughters who are adults at this point. Right. Yeah. She's so afraid that her daughters are going to end up going down the same road that she doesn't want to let them embrace their obvious talents. And so she's always butting heads with letting them follow their path. And, you know, mm -hmm. on the one hand, yeah, that ends up being what happens with Sister. But on the other, Sparkle and, and Dolores rise out of that very nicely. Yeah, yeah. The scene with her and Dee was pretty dramatically different mm -hmm. from the original. And it's not that there's anything wrong. I guess, you know, the nature of the fact that she is no longer the maid in this one, it kind of has to change a little right, bit. But right. I really liked the way that they made it more like giving the two of them a chance, you know, her to tell Dee, I'm really proud of you. And Dee kind of being grateful to her for supporting her and pushing her to do something more with her life. I thought that was a really sweet thing. You know, it's like these three sisters. It's like they all take very divergent paths. One becomes a music success, one becomes a music failure, and the other just goes off and becomes a success elsewhere. Right. So I guess we get to go straight to D from there. Since sure. We're... And that'll be actually because I think Dolores has had like the most improvement from the original film in terms of she was very not fleshed out in the original and here she right. is a very fully fleshed out character. Yes, yes. I love her very like take no guff personality mm -hmm. <laughs> like, when she's talking to Sticks and she's like, okay, I noticed you didn't actually look at me. So I'm going to make sure you notice me and this is what I want. And if you don't give it to me, I'm leaving. Like I just, mm -hmm. I loved her whole attitude. Oh yeah. And even like always getting between Satin and Sister, mm -hmm. even the whole scene where, because this was the era where this black community, the hairstyle is to straighten your hair and have it long and in beehives. She's the first right. of the family to go, no, let's go with the Afro, yeah. you know, because this is the late 60s coming into the 70s. That's where we're going to have that rise in that style. Mm -hmm. Everyone is just scandalized as she walks into the room with an Afro. Right, right. And she just doesn't back down from it and doesn't take any guff about it. Yeah, she's great. I like her a lot. And then she kills someone. <laughs> right, right. Well, it's kind of like you said, like you're building on her attempts to get Satin arrested in the original where she's mm -hmm. trying to save Sister. And then you turn it into that. And it's like, oh, yeah, that's a good twist. That's a good way to uh, make her still directly responsible, but in a much more effective way. You can see why she just kind of wants to just leave and kind of wash her hands of everything. Yeah. You know, I mean, that was a shocking scene. <laughs> it was. But I thought very well done. Mm -hmm. And again, the fallout from it. Mm -hmm. I really liked Dolores in this movie. She was uh, Tika Sumter. She was just fantastic. Yeah, she took a very minor role and definitely called attention to it and made it her own. Mm -hmm. So let's go to sister from there. Do you happen to know how to pronounce? Is it Carmen? Is it a Jogo, you think? A Jojo or a Jogo? I'm not sure. Yeah. But sister, once again, a very powerful performance, great singing voice. And I really like the way they took that prison angle of Levi, mm. which sort of goes nowhere, and put it with Sister instead of having her convicted for manslaughter. Instead of dying, yeah. Right, right. So yeah, she's still taken out of the game, so to speak, but it's a better ending for her since she doesn't die. And I think, you know, it's pretty clear she's going to spend some time in there and hopefully also be cleaned up in the process, but she'll still get to move on with her life once mm -hmm. it's all over. So that's kind of a nice twist to treat it that way instead. And that she basically takes... The, I mean, and it's not, I, I'm not saying that Dolores did anything wrong in the way that she fought against right. Satin, but that right. sister is like, let me take this. I'm the one who's already falling. Let me mm -hmm. take this on me so you can still go out and live your life. Right, right. This was kind of my mess, so to speak, yeah. And this was before you could really argue self-defense <laughs> right. against domestic assault, sadly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's really well handled. I like that a lot. And I like her performance where, again, she doesn't really want to be the star, but she's the mm -hmm. kind of privileged, pretty one of the family where, I mean, they're all beautiful, but she's yeah. the one who always catches everyone's eye and she's kind of used to that. Mm -hmm. So she's used to being the star and the center of attention. And so she just kind of always casually becomes the celebrity. Did you get a good feel on what had happened to her that forced her to move back home? 
No. And I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be defined. No, I, I remember what you're talking about now, yeah. Right. It was one of those things that sort of left me wondering. It's like, apparently she went off to New York, I think. Mm-hmm. Maybe, I guess, to start a career or something that ended up falling through. Because they keep saying, like, oh, you know, why don't you unpack? And she's like, oh, I'm going to be gone in two weeks. And they're like, right. well, yeah, you said that a month ago. So I don't know if it was a relationship that fell apart. But I know she's right. the one who's always butting heads with the mom because the mom sees most of her old past mm-hmm. in Sister. Like, it kind of makes you wonder, like, was it an attempt at a singing career? You would think no, Mm -hmm. because then Mama probably wouldn't have let her back. Right. I think there is a lot of talk about how, you know, I always wanted you guys to marry a lawyer or marry a doctor. Mm -hmm. And I know that was always a bit of a clash with Dee, where the mom wants Dee to marry a doctor, not necessarily (laughs) become one. Right. But I like the performance. I like the way that she starts to kind of get caught up in things and Mm -hmm. gets, of course, the allure from Levi to Satin, where... She just isn't interested in these small little humble things. She's interested in the rich things that this guy can buy her. Right, right. And what fame can gain her. Yes. So what did you think about the changes to Satin's character? I liked it. I like that they turned him into a comedian Mm -hmm. who has a TV career, but he's kind of sleazy. He gets a lot of gruff for jokes that he makes at the expense of the black community in order to appease a white audience. It's interesting that they're showing the fall of his career Mm -hmm. contrasted against the rise of these sisters and how he is very much that celebrity who's now being overshadowed and doesn't like it and resents that. Right, right. And that's where he starts taking out his frustrations on sister, whom he's also hooked on drugs. Yeah, I mean, I think it creates a more natural progression to see how the abuse starts ramping up. And I don't think this film is hurt in any way by removing all ties to like the mob or gangster type society. I think it wasn't really necessary and... It's all focused on the entertainment industry. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, I think it really makes sense. And yeah, him falling while she's rising and it creates a nice little natural conflict. And while it certainly doesn't justify his actions in any way, you at least understand them a little more. Yeah, like when he tries out the new material where he's trying trying to appeal more towards the black audience and it flops yeah he had already run that material by sister who said it was good and so he blames her right right yeah that whole scene where he just tears into her yeah and i gotta say mike epps i've never really been the biggest fan of in comedies Mm -hmm. i've always just found too buzzed that he's too much of like a (laughs) stoner style comedian Uh uh-huh but in this role kind of a more dramatic role where he's the villain i thought he was really good at being chilling and skiing yes I agree. Yeah, he did a really good job here. Whereas you also see the frustrations with his own career stalling and not going anywhere, but also then the toxic angle of him blaming everyone else for it. Yeah. And like even the dinner scene. Oh, yeah. Where he just invites himself over to family dinner and like gets kicked out three minutes later. But just the tension of that scene. Oh, yeah. That scene is so uncomfortable. It's mm-hmm. <laughs> and you can almost feel it. With not only him and, and the mom, but him and the pastor where he's like, mm-hmm. you're just another form of entertainment. You just get paid at pews, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That was a really good scene. I did like the pastor in this. He was funny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So Styx, played by Derek Luke here, Mm -hmm. I feel like he's maybe a little more understated. Maybe it's just because they give Sparkle so much more autonomy in this one that he doesn't always have as much to do. Like, he just doesn't stand out to me as much as I felt like he did in the first film. But it's not a bad role. The main reasons for that are, like you mentioned, they wanted to give Sparkle more agency. Mm -hmm. He doesn't sing in this version. There's one scene where he kind of does a little bit where they're trying to echo the big scene from the original. Right. But you could tell the actor's not a singer. And so he's not involved from day to day. And also, Styx was the one who got everything started in the original. He was the one who's like, what if we put together an act? What if we go do the Mm -hmm. show? Which he does here as well, but she already had the drive to do it. He's just sort of saying, well, okay, do the sister act. We could take it to the next level. Right. And that'll help you get there. Right. That's one of the things that I actually kind of liked a little more in the original was it's literally just this group of teenagers who all sing in a choir together Mm -hmm. who are like, hey, what if we did this? And then what if we go to the next step? And then what if we go to the next step? Here, it's kind of like he's already a manager who's just moving to another location. Mm -hmm. And her and sister are already on this forward thrust in the music career. And then their paths converge. And I don't think that's as clean of a start. I understand why they did it. Right. And it's also interesting that like all the kids in this one are all in their 20s as opposed to teenagers. It kind of creates a sort of unnecessary conflict. Because at first, you're like, oh, he's really sweet. He's trying to encourage her. 
she suddenly realizes, like, oh, wait, you're not really interested in me. You're really just interested in my sister. Hmm. But then it all just sort of gets forgiven and swept under the rug. Right. So, yeah, I really feel like they sort of did a misstep there of, like, that really wasn't a necessary angle to go with. He could have just seen her singing at the piano and recognized their talent and just said, hey, let's make it a girl group because those are really popular. And I think that would work really well. And you wouldn't have to have that conflict there in the beginning like that. What I get from that is he's always been drawn to Sparkle, but he's kind of fooled by the allure that everyone else has of sister is the main draw. Yeah. As the story goes along, I think he starts to become less drawn into that illusion. And also when he leaves, it's then Sparkle who comes back to him and says, look, I'm going out. I'm making a career but I still need your knowledge and your abilities to help me get there. Right. And so it's not so much forgiving him as starting over. Yeah, I guess like one thing about it, though, is because they bring that focus on the conflict, I felt like then it was sort of like, well, wait, I know she like rides on the back of his motorcycle a couple times (laughs) and they go to the club. But then when he's like, I'm leaving and I want you to come with me, it's like, wait, are you two even in a relationship? Like, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't feel like there was enough there that when that scene came around, it was like, no, just leave, dude. She clearly doesn't care that much. (laughs) Like, I don't know. And we know it's not a sexual relationship because later on in the film, she mentions she's still a virgin. Whereas in the original film, it's like they had sex like in the first 10 minutes. I don't know if it was that soon, but yeah. But again, that was because they were young and they didn't quite understand the relationship's work. And as they go along, they realize we want our focus to be more on the industry than each other. Right. This was a little more of like a Hallmark romance. Mm-hmm. And I gotta say, Derek Luke, one hell of a charming smile. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I was surprised. He's like 20 years older than her. Is he really? Yeah, okay. Derek Luke is already like 43. So he oh, was already wow. pushing 40 at this time. And Jordan Sparks mm-hmm. was like just hitting 20. Okay. Wow. Yeah, I couldn't tell. He's got a young face, I guess. Yeah. And then what's interesting is Levi. Yeah, like, once again, not really a character that is essential to most of this film in any way. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But I think that's okay. It's like he's there in that first act to sort of help get things going and to have that moment with sister mostly as a way so you can kind of see where her priorities lie, what's important to her, that Mm -hmm. kind of thing. But we do see him. He is in the comedy club as well, right? When Satin is doing his failed performance. He's the one who's heckling him. Right. Right. That's what I thought. But it's like weird because I'm at that moment and I'm like, that's Levi, right? Like we mm-hmm. haven't seen him in so long <laughs> that I'm still kind of like, that is still Levi, right? Yeah, I think that's Levi. And so it, you do kind of see that he's achieving his goals as well. Yeah. He's just not an essential part of this story. So it's interesting, like his entire arc is just in the first half of the movie, but it is a complete arc. Yeah. And it is interesting how different it is. Because mm-hmm. again, like they move the whole prison angle to sister and they've removed the right. whole drug dealer and mob aspects out. Mm -hmm. He's just more the cousin of Styx who's never able to get the success of Styx. Right, right. And he falls in love with this completely unattainable goal who's not interested in him. Right. That was the one thing about that scene where he's like offering her all these things. It's like, dude, you don't even know her. Yeah. Why would you be proposing marriage to someone? Like, I understand you have big dreams and stuff like that, but it's like, you don't even know this girl and she has been nothing but cold to you. (laughs) This whole time. Well, back in the day, (laughs) people were just proposing marriage after meeting someone, yeah? I guess so. (laughs) It was an interesting arc. And again, his character wasn't necessary to the overall story. But it was nice how they still gave him a complete story within the section that he's in. Mm -hmm. And then did we want to just kind of mention some of the other people who pop up through the movie? The record producer, Larry... In Mm. this one, I feel like he's sort of filling in for Mama's boss. It's obviously a very different role, Mm -hmm. but it's a change that makes a lot more sense to give this guy who's got the record connections. You know, you don't need to go borrow money from someone to produce a record. Obviously, the logical thing to do is to go to a label and try to get signed. So it's a good part. Curtis Armstrong is a great comedic actor I've seen in so many different things. I'm glad to see that Booger is doing well for himself. (laughs) Yeah, it was a nice little part. It was perfect, I think, for the film. You know, he's playing, I guess, a fairly stereotypical record exec role. But I like that he's also a guy who clearly has common sense and Mm -hmm. cares about the people that are coming through his door. Yeah. And I like scenes like where he's first meeting the group and he's gushing to sister and he's like, oh, and you two are here, you know, and (laughs) I didn't even hear the singing. 
And then like the whole thing where he gives them this opportunity. And then that's when he finds sister on the floor with drugs in the bathroom and Mm -hmm. it just all falls apart. And then I was so happy then that they had the comeback where Sparkle goes and just spends days in his waiting room Mm -hmm. to get even just a minute of time. And then she gives that great pitch to him and he's sold on it. See, once again, this movie brings back the montages, but in this case, I always am (laughs) able to follow the montages and know exactly what's happening in them. Well, I think that's because these ones were designed to be montages where the original was taken fully shot scenes and was turning them into montages. Sure, yeah. And then like a couple others were uh, Toon Ann, who was the girl from the original film who was like, I think I'm going to shit my pants, you know? (laughs) She kind of pops up here, but doesn't do much. Yeah, pretty small role. Yeah. It's almost like they acknowledged her name just so people who knew the original would be like, yep, that character's still here. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. I couldn't tell if she was one of the backup singers for Sparkle or not, because it kept them so in the background. I think she was, but yeah. See, I would think she was, but I couldn't tell. I might have just assumed that she was one of them, but I think she was in there. Because that was always such a nice arc in the original where she's just this other girl who's always hanging around and is funny. And when the sisters leave, they try to bring her into the group, but it doesn't quite work out. But then she becomes one of Sparkle's backup. So she's just always kind of there. Right. She's just this constant presence. In this one, it's kind of like she pops up every now and then. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Waters. Yeah. Tamala Mann in this one, the mom's friend. She's great. I think she brought a lot to it. She was a good counterpoint to the way that Emma was reacting to their careers and caring about these girls. And yeah, I liked her a lot. What's interesting is in the original film, she was always the kind of sarcastic one Mm -hmm. who was always just taking digs and jabs at everyone while the mom was kind of being supportive. In this one, it's the mom is the combative sarcastic (laughs) one and Miss Waters is her Jiminy Cricket Uh almost. (laughs) Right. You're still making the same mistakes. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> that was nice. Yeah. And then the Reverend was fun. And then uh, CeeLo mm. Green as the club show host in the opening. Was he the host or he was just a performer, I think? I think he was running the club. Oh, uh, okay. Who was also the performer. It felt more like a little tribute to him. It wasn't yeah. much of a role, but it was just kind of like a nice nod and appearance by him. And he's not that good when he has to act. Right. What are you doing? <laughs> Why are yeah. you doing this? What are you doing? <laughs> And he's like repeating the same. But hey, it was a quick scene. So. It was. It was. <laughs> Speaking of nods, I did like that their big opportunity was opening for Aretha Franklin, which she doesn't make an appearance in the film, but it's just a nice way to give her an acknowledgement for the way that she recorded that original soundtrack. Right. And then also one fun little cameo to mention. When Sparkle is later in the film where she gets her own first apartment as that tiny little one, Mm. the landlord is producer, co-writer Howard Rosenman. Oh, okay. (laughs) You just kind of see him standing in the background, but yeah. Right, yeah. That was another little thing that I liked that that comes to that point where mom is like, oh, no, you're not going to do this. And she's trying to like throw away the book and everything. And so Sparkle just kind of quietly goes, okay, moving out. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and then the whole scene where she comes back to the house to try to invite the mom to the concert. The mom is just mm-hmm. completely walling her off. Right. Yeah, she's playing it cold there. But then I still love how she shows up and Sparkle getting a <laughs> nosebleed that had not been established as something that she suffers yeah, from. Yeah, that was right. It's like, okay, why does she have a nosebleed all of a sudden? Like, so mom shows up with a red dress. If you bleed on it, it'll be fine. Yeah, like, and I get it, like, the mom had a clothing store, so she would have a dress at the ready. That still just does not feel like the type of dress that that mom would give her daughter. No, probably not. And, like, yeah, like, why couldn't her dress just rip or, you know what I mean? Like, like why a Where did the nosebleed come from? Like, wait, is she doing coke, too? I don't think so. (laughs) She seems to be much more on the up and up. But it was still a nice little touch to just see her show up and be willing to support her daughter now. Yeah. There's a lot of really well put together scenes in this. I Mm -hmm. think it's well directed. I would like to see more films by this couple. Again, they've only done one other movie that I could see and they're mostly Mm -hmm. in TV, but I would like to see more of their work. Mm -hmm. Anything else you want to add? I think that's it. That's all I've got. The film was released on August 17th, 2012. What do you think the budget was for this movie? 
I would say it would be in the lower range for that time, I guess is the best way to say it. I don't know exactly how much it cost to make movies by that point. It was $14 million, So that's yeah. pretty cheap, especially right, by today's right. standards. Yeah. It opened the same week as Paranorman, The Expendables 2, and The Odd Life of Timothy Green, which I don't remember that one. And what number do you think Sparkle debuted at? Nine? Close. Seven. Okay, so it did a little bit better. I mean, those are all like, you know, you got a big kids movie there. Yeah. You've got a big old action flick, so it's definitely not going to call as much attention. I'm surprised Expendables 2 opened higher than Paranorman. <laughs> and yeah, and Born Legacy was in its second week. Dark Knight Rises mm. was in its fifth week, so those okay. were all still there. Yeah. And the next week, Sparkle is down to number 11, and mm. nothing else really opened except, do you remember Premium Rush? That name sounds familiar. I think it was like Joseph Gordon-Levitt on a bike. Oh, yeah, 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 That opened yeah. at number eight. Huh. So nothing really big at the time. And then, let's see, in its third week, Sparkle is all the way down to number 14, and that was when The Possession mm. and Lawless came out, and I don't know what either of those are. This was a really crappy time for movies, I guess. Yeah, it sounds like a bit of a low point. <laughs> and let's see, by its fourth week, Sparkle is at number 16, so it's kind of still hovering in that area. Yeah. The Words opened at number four. I don't know what these movies are. Yeah, I have no... What time of year was this? August, September. So this is kind of the dump. Yeah, kind of. That's why a lot of these were literally just movies that were probably released and forgotten about for the most part. Yeah, and then we're getting past 20, so we'll end it here. And it's fifth week, Sparkle is at 27. Mm -hmm. And that's when Resident Evil Retribution opened at number one. Okay. And the 3D re-release of Finding Nemo opened at number two. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not a good uh, season for movies. No. I would expect this would potentially have had more success once it was out on, I don't know if that would have been DVD or Blu-ray at that yeah. point, though. This is one I don't think I would need to get Blu-ray high def, but no. this one I think would play well on TV. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I would think so, too. So ultimately, its total domestic gross was just $24 million. Okay. So it's still like $10 million above its budget. I wouldn't call it a bomb, yeah. Yeah, I'm sure the soundtrack sold well. I'm sure this one play well on TV. It would probably be a good rental. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think it just kind of opened in the dump season, where it's like the post-blockbuster season, before we get to right. the Oscar season, where it's just kind of like, hey, here's what else we have laying around. And I think they did delay the release release because of Whitney Houston's death yes. by like a month. So I don't know if that may have affected it. They just pushed it back by one week. Was it one week? Okay. She had passed away in the February of that year. Okay. So it had been a while. Okay. So it had been a while, but I guess for whatever reason, they decided to delay it a little bit longer. Hmm. Well, you wouldn't think it would have been to add the in memoriam because they could have done that probably yeah. before it was ready to release. I'm wondering if they maybe did some re-editing, like maybe the scene with her singing at the church was maybe mm. not quite as long or doing the duet at the end. Yeah, it's possible. Maybe repositioning that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Could be that they had scenes that they had pulled out that they decided to kind of put back in. Hmm, maybe so. Don't we felt like the flow of the film was affected by that, if it was? No, I don't. didn't seem like it. Felt pretty natural. So anyways, and one final tidbit is mm -hmm. that Howard Rosenman and Joel Schumacher are both trying to get Sparkle redone again as a Broadway musical. Which is a good place for it. Yeah. They have all of the Curtis Mayfield songs and the R. Kelly songs and are going to add five mm -hmm. new ones. Okay. That's been in the works for at least a couple of years now. So we'll see. Because I know Joel, mm -hmm. we'll get to it at those points in his career. He has directed for stage a couple of times. Okay. Only a couple, but mm -hmm. apparently they were pretty successful. So it'd be interesting to see him take a stab at a big musical. Most of his plays are like small closed room thrillers. Okay. That he's uh -huh. done more off Broadway type stuff. So it'd be right. interesting to see him do like a big lush Broadway play play mm -hmm. neon and black lights and <laughs> you've got to kind of expand things a bit to fit in the time for so it'd be interesting to see if like levi would come back and have more of a larger role or what you might end up doing and it would be interesting would they go back to the original script would they include elements of the new script you kind of have to do both right because if you're going to include the r kelly songs then you've certainly got to have the remake included but you could still do that as a tribute to her dead sister that's true but I think that would be stronger to, God, imagine the great musical number you could get with Sister in Prison, you know? Yeah. I think it would be a stronger one to do that, lose out the crime angle, 
We don't need the whole musical mm-hmm. number of them driving around with sticks with a gun to his head. Yeah, definitely keep the remakes ending rather than <laughs> go back to that original thing that, no. <laughs> I mean, I could see a really nice kind of fusion where you could start like the original where it's the five kids from a church mm-hmm. choir, but then as it goes along, you start to fold more into the remake and right, it'd be right. interesting to see what they choose to do with it if it comes about. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of interesting that you've got this sort of parallel with Dreamgirls, which that was a musical first and then became a film, you know, whereas now you've got this film that's very similar and now they want to make it into a musical. (laughs) Right. And I'm wondering how much backlash this remake got when it came out. Because, yeah, Mm -hmm. so the original Sparkle was 1976. The original Dreamgirls play was 1980, 1981. Mm -hmm. And then the Dreamgirls movie was 2006. And then the Sparkle remake was 2012. So I'm wondering if when this came out, I didn't look enough into like the reviews of when this came out. I'm wondering if people just kind of brush this off as a knockoff of Dreamgirls. Yeah, I could certainly see that some of their investors probably looked at the success of the Dreamgirls film and went, oh, yeah, we can totally support this. I think it'll be successful. But yeah, you're right. It'd be interesting to see if the critical response reacted negatively or not to thinking it was a ripoff, even though it clearly wasn't. Well, according to this, Roger Ebert gave it three out of four, so he at least liked it. (laughs) Well, that's good. It's an interesting one to look at, you know, Joel Schumacher's first film as Mm -hmm. a writer, and then this. I'm kind of glad he wasn't involved in it, because Hmm. I like the people that they got involved in this, because I think they did a very good job fleshing out and redeveloping the story. Right. Even though I like the original. And I guess maybe the musical will give us that chance to see, like, what he might have suggested or contributed. But you're right. The team that they did have involved is definitely a good team. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't want to push any of them out to put him in. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, I don't have anything else to add. Yeah, I think that about wraps it up. We thank you all for joining us, and we hope you check out Sparkle in one form or another. And definitely let us know what you think if you do. Yes. For additional episodes or to leave a comment, please visit schumacast.blogspot.com. That's S-C-H-U-M-A-C-A-S-T dot blogspot.com. Our opening song, Letter, and our closing song, Vein Blossom, were both created by Jack Locke and are used with permission. To hear more, please visit jacklocke.com. That's J-A-K-L-O-C-K-E dot com. Schumacast is in no way affiliated with Joel Schumacher or the copyright holders of the films discussed. All rights are reserved and no infringement is intended. Yeah, I was surprised Philip Michael Thomas, who plays Dix, he hasn't really done much except for like voice acting in the Grand Theft Auto games. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I guess when you're on Miami Vice, why not? (laughs) Well, he spent the majority of the 90s as the spokesman for the Psychic Hotline Network. (laughs) (laughs) That may not have helped. (laughs) And then was, you remember Miss Cleo? Yes, yes. He was replaced with Miss Cleo and then sued them (laughs) for breach of contract. (laughs) Wow. And won. (laughs) Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. I guess that means he believed it, unless he just liked the paycheck. I don't know. (laughs) I I don't know, but he did it for like seven, eight years. He even did an album for them. (laughs) Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. Like, what if all the songs about, if you need help, pick up the phone? (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. How do you do a psychic hotline album? I guess you have to look it up and find out. Your fortune is this. Your fortune (laughs) is bliss. Your fortune is never gonna be a miss. 3.99 a minute. <laughs> <laughs>